what society has done is, and modern day feminism, it's made women believe that we're the same as men. And by doing that, it's actually completely re-enslaved us to feeling like we're not good enough and internalizing. I can't do that. I'm feeling emotional. I'm feeling really tired. I want to be a mother. I want to have a baby. X, Y, Z, I'm trying to juggle all this stuff. And now I don't feel good enough because what that has done is this society has created more of a competition between men and women rather than the fact that yes we're ex we're equal i'm just as equal as a man and man is just as equal as me but we're not the same yes and so it's really important as well to look at the society around us because a lot of the time women will internalize their own stuff because we've been taught to behave like men Welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have Grace Prosser. Grace is a spiritual teacher and Mary Magdalene womb empowerment healer. With a captivating journey spanning over eight years, she has dedicated herself to refining her profound knowledge, wisdom and intuitive spiritual gifts all centered around helping women heal and empower themselves by connecting to the depths of their soul essence and womb. Grace's celestial calling transcends boundaries reaching out to women from all walks of life whether you're a devoted stay-at-home mom a driven working mom a fearless single mom a child-free woman embracing her independence or even if you're navigating a nine-to-five job, part-time work, entrepreneurship, or a student life, Grace is here for you. I am super excited to interview this incredible woman. Let's bring her on. Hi, Grace. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, at the time we're filming this, we just come out of full moon, <laughs> and I'm sure you can you can tell how how strong the energy is right now isn't it yeah so strong absolutely I mean the full moon is something that highlights um so many different things for us globally personally in our relationships in all corners of our lives mm -hmm. you know it's here to shine the light on things but also it can be uh to shine on where you're not truly stepping up <laughs> yeah. those parts of us that are afraid to be a bit too much and a bit too bright <laughs> yeah 100 percent. so I've, I'm definitely feeling this I'm sure many of our yeah. listeners are as well um we actually met through well we haven't met in person but we oh. got introduced by Tim Marner so I was on um his his podcast show and he's like you know what at the end of it he was speechless because when I was sharing my story he's like you know what you need to connect with Grace he <laughs> kept saying you need to connect with Grace I was like who's Grace <laughs> connect with Grace I was and like, then right, then. <laughs> yeah he's like I'm on it <laughs> yeah, he up, didn't he? Oh, I love that and that's the most I love it when life happens like that through just the flow hundred mm, percent and that's what it was complete yeah. flow um so obviously I know a bit about you our listeners don't know who you are so tell us a bit about who Grace is what's your background what do you what do you do so my name's Grace Prosser <laughs> um I'm 35 and I'm a spiritual teacher and Mary Magdalene womb healing and menstrual cycle empowerment teacher um so really briefly, I guess, how I'm here, um, even though it's a very, very long story. Um, so as a child, um, I actually grew up in, in quite a destructive household um, for about, I would say, about 10, 15 years. Um, so I developed uh, quite a lot of spiritual practices as a child to help me through what I was going through so things like prayer um opening myself up to guides um and things like that that I was able to open up to because I really didn't really have much choice 
if that makes sense you know as a child when you're you don't really have choices that you do as an adult you you have to deal with your environment so it was from a really young age as well where I would pick up on um energy um I would have to learn how to read people's energy read the room um so I think my my ability is spiritually um and also energetically started really really young um in my teens um when I had my first ments my first moon which is one of the most psychic times for um for for a young teenager and a woman um in that time I recall where I used to make sacred altars um and this was very much kind of um like the Indian tradition so I was creating altars um but I wasn't didn't learn these from anyone I just kind of was channeling something um and I would yeah I would just sit in peace at them and I I believe like around that time it was something that was just keeping me keeping me going if that makes sense and having faith and having a belief that there is something so much more powerful within us um you know the universe God the light whatever you want to kind of uh call it I knew from so so young I just knew that it wasn't just this external world that was here. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of, I was always very emotionally intelligent as a child, um, more so that way than academic. Um, so it was it was kind of all about creation for me and um, expression and things like that. Um, but I guess then life happens, right? You get to a point where you've got to, go get a job and figure life out and that's when I kind of just went straight into the system and got my A-levels, got my degree, studied, you know, um, things like that and my spiritual kind of connection faded for, for a long time because it wasn't validated in the world that we live in. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was taken seriously. It, I couldn't be that version of me because it wouldn't have got me anywhere <laughs> um, at that point in my life. And so, yeah, I just kind of ended up on the hump, the wheel of life. Um, I actually then ended up working after university in the sex industry for a while and, um, Firstly, I started modeling and then um, due to, you know, a bit of blackmail um, manipulation through those kind of industries, um, I ended up on a um, program called Babe Station, which is an adult chat show. Um, firstly, I started on the daytime shows. So it was actually more about just communicating with men or women on a really clean, there was no dirty chat, there was no sex chat or anything like that. You were actually not allowed. Um, it was against the law to speak like that on daytime TV. So it actually became more about just creating bonds with these people calling. And actually, a lot of the people that called were very lonely or they were unable to connect with the world in certain ways through maybe disabilities or social anxiety. So actually, in a sense, um, there was really good parts of that because these people became almost like my friends, you know, um, and, and these men became very supportive and I would listen to them and, you know, it's almost like counseling in a, in a way um, for both of us. And so actually, um, it wasn't too, you know, destructive being on the daytime shows. However, it still comes with a lot of labels, a lot of judgments. Um, and, you know, you are, you are putting yourself in a position where it's more vulnerable. Um, in the end, purely for financial reasons, I ended up going on the nighttime shows, which was more sex chat um you know completely different and so um I had training 
with all different types of things, all different types of like um, sexual energies we had to learn. We actually had formal training once a month about how to speak, how to move, um, how to learn about the psychology of the men that were calling and what they perhaps wanted from the conversation. Um, and so I was quite smart in a sense. I had a plan to get out. It, was, it wasn't it was for me something I wanted to do forever. I wanted to create a business. So um, I set a goal of earning a certain amount of money um, and I stuck to that. And I just, I worked crazy hours. Like uh, sometimes it would be, sometimes I would even do the morning show. So I would be on from say like getting ready at about five o'clock. You're, you're on at like eight, eight, nine. And then that goes through till 5am in the morning. And then I would sometimes do the morning show till like eight, 9am. Uh, so it was like, it was real hustle culture. It, it was, it was hustle culture, get your money and do what you've got to do. Um, and so in this time, I'd had boyfriends and things on and off, but I did meet a long-term partner I was with. He supported that. Um, and then I ended up leaving and um, doing like webcam and things like that just to tick me over with money. So I ended up creating my swimwear company where I was designing swimwear. It was always something I wanted to do as a little girl in that like, you know, creative era that I was in when I was young. Um, so I made that dream come true and it did go big really fast. I had no kind of background in retail or finance or anything, um, but I kind of, I just winged it to be honest, like I really did. But I had a really supportive uh, partner at the time. Anyway, I kind of ended up building this life of what I thought was this perfect life, like the money, the car, the house, the boyfriend, the shoes, the bags, the Botox, the holidays, the everything. And I'm not discrediting that. I think that luxuries of life are amazing. I think it's important that we also value ourselves outside of that. And I just didn't have an idea of who I actually was. Um, and eventually I... You know, me and my partner kind of drifted apart a little bit because I'd got everything I wanted, but there was something missing. And I was having episodes as well, like really emotional episodes. Um, and I realized my childhood is not spoken about. It hasn't been dealt with. Um, and I noticed it coming up a lot more, the feelings as I got into like my mid twenties. And so the partner I was with, he he wasn't the type of person that could hold that. He just wasn't. Mm. He, you know, it was just not in his biology as a man to be able to hold any of what I'd gone through. It, it, it was more of a shallow life we were living in. Mm. And that's also not to discredit him as a human being because he helped me through a lot of stuff. But for me, it just wasn't deep enough. I needed to go deeper. And I remember being away in Miami for like a work trip. And we were in this like amazing club and these amazing people. And it was just incredible. And I had a drink spill over me and it was this red juice. And I just was so angry like ridiculously angry that this person had spilled a drink all down my dress. Um, and my friend just tapped me on the shoulder and he just gave me like, the biggest reality check. He just brought me straight back down to the depth of who I am. Mm. And he was like, look around, is anyone looking at you? And I was like so embarrassed because everyone was just having a good time. No one was looking at what had happened to my dress. Mm. And he was just like, we love you. And in that moment, it was kind of like he loved me in my mess. He noticed I was a mess. He just took his time out to just be present with me. And I don't think I'd ever had that before. Mm. Um, and so I went to the toilet to like, clean my dress up. And I remember looking in the mirror 
and like that's when it all changed I was like this is my life is is this isn't it my life's done how it was like I knew it was done I didn't know how but I just knew from that moment that things were going to change and I got home and they started to change and that's when I started to meditate again um I'd not done it in my adulthood life um and I sat and started to meditate in the bath and then my three angel guides came through and then they started to give me techniques of healing this trauma and emotion through out of my body um and they asked me to visit them every day in the bath basically until until they said so um so I did and I kept it quite private because it wasn't really something anyone was really doing or talking about mm-hmm. at the time. This was back in, I think, 2015. Um, so, yeah, so it was it was it was kind of new. And I just had to go on the journey on my own, really, with just trusting again my guides and um, just trusting that process. And then actually. um even though I had the support of my guides, which I think is a really important message for people to know is even when you're on the spiritual path, it doesn't mean things don't happen to us as human beings. I had these amazing guides helping me. I was healing my body and I was starting to deal with pain and trauma, but my life actually got deep darker after that. Um, I guess they just needed to know I was willing and ready to go through this that next burning phase and I I was and yeah. so it got darker I found out my partner was having an affair um with a, a very close friend of mine um and then eventually after that breakup I kind of spiraled so I went into more smoking drinking not you know kind of being here I was I was I was separated from my body I was so unembodied Mm -hmm. I wanted to escape and so I found that in so many different ways toxic relationships sex smoking drinking um even porn things like that like they're just easy ways out of life um and so in the end, that obviously caught up with me. It was not going to go. My spirit team were like, not for long. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was still connecting to them every now and then, but just not very much. And then eventually my company actually took a really dark turn and I lost my money. I had lost the house that I lived with my partner and I actually left the house that I'd bought. And I just, yeah, I just left that obviously leaving him and the family and the environment and the friends that I had in that time. Um, And then around that time as well, so company gone, money, family I'd built, relationships. um, And all I knew was my company. (laughs) All I knew was grace the bikini designer you know and so part of my identity was just gone um and so everything was just wiped from under my feet and um I went into like a really deep depression like dark depression and I didn't really see a way out I didn't know how or what like I I just didn't it was dark um and so then it got darker (laughs) And you would think a spirit would be like, okay, but obviously I, I wasn't quite there yet of being like, Grace, know your strength. You've got this. Um, I lost a baby and then my sister passed away about three to four weeks later. Um, and then it was with my grieving process um, that I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm either going to probably die and not be here or end up somewhere like I don't even know or I have to take this seriously and then it was that moment I was like I'm just done with that part like I'm ready like I'm ready to just take this seriously and um so I did and I made that commitment that devotion and I just haven't looked back since wow 
Wow, mm-hmm. that is a, quite a journey. I've got so many questions to ask. You. Yeah. <laughs> right, I'll start with um gosh, okay, so I now understand why Tim connected us because at a point where I said I sat with myself for 2 years asking myself two questions, how are you feeling? Are you okay? And that's when all of my trauma would come up and for me to purge. And you went through that as well. That period where I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. I thought Mm -hmm. I was the only person going through it. I need to purge this out of my body, all this trauma. So can we talk a bit about that? Because I know many people talk about the release of the trauma and how it's done and how do you hold space for yourself in that moment? Yeah, I think it's it's going to be different for everyone, isn't it, as well? Who And it depends what they've been through. I, I would firstly, if I could give myself advice at that time, it would definitely have been to ask for more help mm. because I did think I was alone on it and I didn't know where to turn to. But I think now there is so much out there for us to help. I mean, there's even podcasts about it, right? Like back then, the, there really wasn't anything. It was just simply you and spirit. But I think for me, it was a matter of trust. Like it was that simple trust that that I was safe to be emotional and let it leave my body. Like it wasn't going to mean anything else other than just what it was. It was like taking the meaning out of, it all and just letting it be and letting it release and not having to fix it but just being with it witnessing it and not asking it to even change it's like sitting down in that version of who you are in that trauma or whatever it is you're releasing and just saying I got you you don't need to change for me you don't need to be anything for me I'm not going to force you to change or be anything more than what you are. I'm just going to sit and witness you in this. And that way the energy just is able to release rather than thinking you've got to bend it to release that way or this way or that way or up here or down there. And it's like witness it, be with it. That's kind of the most loving thing you could ever do because there are not many people from when we're young to now that just sit and witness there's always some kind of you know plan or strategy Mm -hmm. and so sometimes I think that's the most powerful thing we can do is just be like I'm just gonna witness you and you are safe because I'm you know this powerful version of me this higher version of me this this witnessing energy has got you like whether that's you're in a child, whether that's you're in a teenager, whether that's from an adulthood trauma, whatever that part is, all you they usually want is to be seen, heard, and loved. Mm. And so. I, yeah, and I think it's it's really important to point out that you know it's like, like our busy lives. We're constantly, like you said, we're on the go. We're distractions, and you know you had your ways to cope with stuff that you wanted to uh, brush aside and I had my coping mechanism but there comes a point where you kind of hit a wall you can't move anymore to it's like I say it's like when you suffer enough that's when you're going to change your life yeah yeah and for to witness that you you've been through what you've been through to see Mm -hmm. that to, to really sit here and hear you experience that journey of that transformation ex- expansion and growing pains and coming out of that it's like cocoon like caterpillar going into a cocoon and then becomes a butterfly it's really beautiful to see yeah it is nice it's like really unfortunate so some people who don't experience that and then they like they leave this planet without even realizing their worth and value mm, yeah it's because of the it's the linear process, isn't it, that people are stuck in and it's scary to sit with yourself and witness whatever it wants to be without right. changing it. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's definitely a, something that you've got to, you've got to trust the process. It's something that you've got to know 
isn't all rainbows, butterflies, but the, the other side is is really beautiful. Like, and I think when you do and we when you allow yourself to feel, to heal, that is truly where life matters. Like it's how you know you're actually alive. You know, when I wasn't feeling, when I was suppressing everything, when I was depressed, I didn't feel alive. Mm-hmm. I felt like there was something missing. I felt I felt like everything around me was alive, but inside me was dead. And so you've got to feel to be able to feel like you're actually alive because that's the whole point of being human. Mm-hmm. It's the whole point of being here. And it is difficult. So for anyone listening, I would... I would I would always suggest, you know, if anyone ever comes to me, I always ask them, what's your spiritual practice look like first? Um, because you want to firstly learn how to ground and be stable. Because if you are going to dive into trauma healing work or things that may be coming up for you, you want to have a level of stability in your spiritual, soulful you know, aspect of yourself. Mm. If we don't have that, it can be very easy to get then lost in the spirituality world and not be grounded. And that can actually cause more trauma and conflict and confusion. So the one thing I would do is, the first thing I ever do is you've got to go back to the great mother. You've got to go back to the earth. You've got to start grounding. Really learn how to ground through meditation, through touch, through disconnecting with the outdoors the land um and that's going to be you're going to thank yourself you know for that water is a really good way to ground which I think is why my guides were teaching me through it when I was in the bath um and if you have a busy life which we all do and you've got children or a job to get to what I did is and what I do now is I make it my morning practice because one, it's so important for it to be in the morning, sets us up for our day. Two, you can get up an hour earlier if you really need to. You know, if you're at work at, you know, from midday, you can't take that hour out, but you do have the luxury of your morning and set that alarm an hour earlier. And it's only you that is gonna not make that decision. Like it's, if you're making an excuse, that's where you've got to look at. So I would say the morning time, if it means you're going to be getting up an hour earlier, meditation, 30 minutes equates to three hours sleep. So you're actually getting more sleep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. it's not going to tire you out. You might be emotions that come up, give yourself space um, and just learn in, in that kind of way where it's going to fit in your day, morning or evening is usually best. Yeah, I usually, um, when I oh, I deliver these workshops called The Importance of Inner Healing, so we go through the stuff where did their emotion started off from, oftentimes if it's with our parents or like when we're younger, right? So I often get them in, the, in a place where they realize, get a lot of insights, but then also they don't want to be dwelling in, it, in, in mm. that for so oh, yeah. long. So it's like, give yourself time, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, let yourself cry, let yourself be angry, release all those emotions and then get up and dance or go to the gym or do something. Cause that's what I kind of, it feels like when I was doing that on my, or by myself, I didn't really see it at that point, but where there was a point where I used to be sitting there, I was like, okay, what trauma, okay, trauma about my dad's coming up. I'm rolling on the floor, cl- crying, grieving the loss of my dad and then getting up. Okay. Time to go and play p- badminton. Just mm. like it's finding that balance of not not doing to the extreme end and you kind of find that on your own yeah and you find your own ways and like you said it's about that play so for me if I've had a big release I love to dance I'll put some good music on I just give myself 10 minutes to just dance or I love massage and oil and it's coming back into the body again, isn't it? It's in, you're embodying it rather than it's because when we're emotional, we can easily escape again. And we want to make sure we're back in the body. So moving your body, going to the gym or things like that, or the oils that I love, or just having a dance or a movement, yoga, something like that. Perfect. So I'm so glad that you said that because it's such an important part of the journey, embodiment. 
Mm, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. You talked about a sacred altar. So those listeners who, who don't know what it is, how yeah. can they set it up? Amazing. So um, I think sacred altars are like really fun. And then you can really bring out your creativity, like your feng shui, your spiritual side. Um, for one, um, it all depends on obviously where you're living, if you've got children, if you've got space. Um, and also kind of like your culture or your background or your faith or your religion, because, you know, it, it all depends. Um, for me, I'm like into faith. I love all different kinds of faiths. Um, you know, I have the Buddha. I have, <laughs> I have Jesus and Mary Magdalene. I have a uh, green Tara or a Kuan Yin. So all of mine are, are Lakshmi. They're all different faiths, Pele. Um, and so I would suggest firstly, just really stripping it back to like, what's your favorite color? Mm. Things like that. What's your favorite smell? What's your favorite color? Go and buy yourself like a beautiful smelling candle that you just adore and keep that sacred for your sacred altar to worship you. Um, if you're starting off with um, an altar, I would start off with worshiping you. So this might be like getting a picture of yourself or a picture of your inner child. Um, you might want to write yourself a love letter. You might want to put some like rose quartz there or some beautiful flowers, um, especially a candle. Um, you might then start adding things to it as you go along. Then you might just get a call in to be like, oh, I think I need, I, I think I need like some kind of other crystal or, you know, or, or, or a different kind of smell at the moment. You know, things like that. It's all about really just channeling who you are and how you would worship you, you know? Um, so I have many different altars, but the one where I worship myself, it used to have um, different things on. Now it has Kuan Yin because Kuan Yin right now, I'm with connecting with her. She's like, I want to be in your altar. I'm looking over you right now. So then with Kuan Yin, it's like if the deities or the goddesses, do attract to you and it might not be that they come into your space in meditation it might be that you just keep seeing them pop up or you might just have a really beautiful sense of oh I really want to learn about that then you can just go and buy like a picture or you might want to learn the mantra for them so you can sit with that altar and just say their mantra you might want some nice incense or things like that um, and then I would recommend kind of getting more guidance if you're going to go and create different kind of altars. Because, for example, you if you're going to call in someone like Kali um, and create an altar for Kali, then you're going to really want to learn how to work with her energy and, and different kind of deities. So, because you've got to think of it like this. If you have a tiger spirit guide for example and you put a picture of a tiger on your altar that tiger is living in your home so imagine an actual tiger walking around your home it's the same as if you've got Kuan Yin or Kali or whatever it is so you've also got to be really careful of what you do decide to put on your altars because you're creating a channel of light so when you create an altar, you create a channel of light that gives access for the divine to come through to your home, to come through to you. So if you're given permission for a really strong deity like Kali to be on your altar, you need to learn what Kali is about. So it's, it is also being mindful of your altars. So if you're beginning, do it for yourself first. Go with the self-love altar. Worship yourself every day. Go over to it and just, I spray my perfume over it sometimes and just ask, ask it how it is. And I just do a nice prayer and light the candle every day and lighten that part of me up you know so I think does that answer the question yeah yeah it's perfect as well it's like it comes through you as well so you got to be in a place to receive it 
right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. oftentimes it's like, okay, well, I have this limiting belief, which, which goddesses works with that, this one, right? And then, oh my God, I'm not willing to work on it. I need to be in that center to, for it to come through for, for me to work on it as well at the same, same. time, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's perfectly explained. I re I remember when I was going through my awakening, which was 2016, it was like such high energy to a point where um, I I ended up in a, probably in another realm. Um, yes. But there was a goddess sitting. It was it, what well, looked like a goddess at that point. She was wearing blue dress, really beautiful. I couldn't see her face because there was like light behind her but she was holding this like gold um what do you call it like a what's it stick <laughs> a yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah she was holding yeah. that and I could see her lips I couldn't see her face I could see her lips she's saying something and I'm trying to figure out wait, what are you trying to say what are you doing I don't know I don't know and then I come back and I'm like who, who were you who were you trying to give me this message what was it what was it can you come again <laughs> no did you was, find out no I doubt still to this day she's probably working behind the scenes and I have no idea what's going on but it, yeah. it was very very it was so really yeah. really strong really strong experience were you working through in a child's stuff at that time I was purging a lot of my trauma at that point so yeah might have been because Mother Mary, um, it, she, also Kuan Yin, Mother Mary and Kuan Yin are so, so similar, but Mother Mary is is literally blue with that light. Really? Behind, and she assists in, like, the most beautiful, like, inner child healing, you know? So um, her as an ascended master is, you know, I... Yeah, I've worked with her quite a lot, and yeah, she's she's definitely a uh, an ascended master who works with inner child stuff. Yeah, so as you described her. her, I just kind of saw her. Yeah, so yeah. definitely her. Then there you go, puzzle solved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> um, so we're talking about obviously goddesses so let's get yeah. into feminine energy because you talk quite a lot about feminine energy yeah yeah um is there anything you particularly want to kind of know how do you tap into feminine energy and yeah. what are your thoughts around it or you work around it yeah perfect um again so I think we all need to be really clear on what we're born into for one so the fact that we're born into a a world that is dominated by a wounded masculine system. We're not quite in the divine masculine system yet. I mean, there are people stepping up, but we're actually all born into a wounded masculine system. And that is females, males, or anyone in between. Um, I will put like a thing out there right now to say that when I speak about feminine and masculine energy, um, it's not gender based. So it's it's actually an energy that exists within whatever gender you are, whether that's man, woman, anything in between, and at all ages as well. And also, if I ever speak, um, you know, about the womb and things like that, it's always autonomy based. So it is if you are born with a reproductive system, that is a, a woman or or a man, you know, so I just want to get those lines crossed with like gender roles and things like that. Um, so if we speak about like the feminine masculine energy, sometimes it is, it is, um, especially in relationships, you can tend to look at like male, female gender roles, um, but they still do happen in like same sex relationships too, because as I said, it's an energy. So as you know, this, I would feel like, firstly, it's kind of asking yourself a question of what do you believe the feminine is? So with my clients, we go through a really beautiful process where I just get them to write down the word divine feminine and what are the words that come up for you, you know? So anyone listening now can do it. What are the words that come up for you when you think or feel about divine feminine? And 
they're going to be different for every single person because we're all taught differently. We all have a different belief on what the feminine is and there is no right or wrong. And so some people might just write down things like goddess and, and beauty and strength and mother and wise and intuitive and, um, you know, all these really gorgeous, beautiful energies. But what women nine times out of 10 forget to do is they forget actually, you know, what is the feminine? What what else is the feminine? It's like, but that is the feminine. I'm like, there is way more to the feminine than those. So then we go, I ask, you know, think about yourself, like your emotions, your menstrual cycle. Um, what about when you've manipulated a man with your sexuality? You know, are you man- is the feminine manipulative? Yes, the feminine is very manipulative. Is she destructive? Yes, she's very destructive. Is she volcanic? Absolutely. Like she is, t- is she a temptress? Of course she is. Like we have that worm sacral, like temptress, destructive, um, dark feminine energy as well. And so I believe it's very, very important from the beginning, if you are looking at feminine energy, to really get clear that it's not just beauty, wisdom, intuition. It's also all the other things. But those other things are also just as powerful as as the beauty. And obviously this is like the shadow and the light, the dark and the light feminine. So that kind of feminine energy on both sides, the dark and the light is really important for us to really start to accept because you can go on the journey of leaning into these really radiant feminine parts, but they don't exist without the manipulation parts and the, you know, the the kind of temptress and the explosive or manipulation. And it doesn't mean to say you got to be in them energies. It just means you're aware of them because they exist. And for so long, women have pushed them down. And this is what has caused the imbalance. This is what has caused women to feel so unsafe in their emotions, feel so misunderstood all the time, not belonging because those darker emotions have been told are unlovable, they're not pretty, men won't like them, you won't get a job if you're doing that, like all these different things, but they are part of the feminine, there is no way we can get away from them. So again, when I teach about connecting back to your feminine energy, the best thing you can do is connect back to your menstrual cycle, your womb, it's where the core of it is. And when you connect back to that, you begin to realize the whole spectrum of who you are as a feminine being. And I think that's where the feminine energy can be really transformative in, in your life. Um, so firstly, getting really clear on your belief system, knowing that there's no right or wrong, facing some of your darker ones and just admitting them. I, you know, I admit I have a really dark temptress energy and I have to really, I have to really like love her a lot because Otherwise, she can be quite destructive, you know, and that's not a bad thing. Um, And then look at your relationship with your cycle, because the cycle is the divine intelligence. It's the first thing. It's, It's the first thing that created us. So it has a lot of feminine power for you to connect to, for you to to lean into in so many multiple different ways. You've, oh my God, this is amazing. I was like, I've got so many questions. Like I need to go, but like just a couple of questions. So we, we, okay. We just started talking about the moon cycle. Now mm-hmm. your, your, your cycle of uh, female cycle, menstrual yeah. cycle. So can we talk about that? Because you talk about seasons. Mm-hmm. So I've not, I don't think I've come across that. So I think many of our listeners might not either. Yeah. So can you talk a bit more about that. Yeah. So I'll go through like the four seasons of, of the cycle for you. Um, so when I was moving through this, firstly through my Magdalene womb healing, obviously we, we learn 
we learn and we're trained in in different forms of connecting to the womb, healing the womb, healing those feminine energies and and kind of getting a closer relationship with them. Um, And the one thing that is just so apparent, obviously, is the emotions that we get through the cycle, which we all know. Um, And again, like we're born into a world that doesn't value the cycle. Like we value a 24 hour clock. Um, So again, I'm going from anatomy when I speak about this, but if you have a man with um, who has a rhythm of a 24 hour clock within his hormones, so when a man wakes up every single day with the sun rising, the sun being the masculine, the solar, um, his testosterone levels will rise. When the sun goes down, his testosterone levels will go down. This is why men can kind of like get up and go straight to the gym as soon as they wake up and they've got this kind of energy that is just there. Mm. Um biologically we're so different what society has done is and modern day feminism it's made women believe that we're the same as men and by doing that it's actually completely re-enslaved us to feeling like we're not good enough and internalizing I can't do that I'm feeling emotional I'm feeling really tired I want to be a mother I want to have a baby X, Y, Z, I'm trying to juggle all this stuff and now I don't feel good enough because what that has done is this society has created more of a competition between men and women rather than the fact that, yes, we're ex- we're equal. I'm just as equal as a man and man is just as equal as me, but we're not the same. Yes. And so it's really important as well to look at this society around us because a lot of the time women will internalize their own stuff because we've been taught to behave like men Mm. we've been taught to work like men exercise like men eat like men do all the things like men and our inner rhythm does not work like that we have a four-week rhythm so whereas men have one every day we have one every four weeks so they're very consistent. They're, ma- they're, they're more consistent with their hormones than we are. And this isn't to say that men aren't emotional because they absolutely are. They also need that space. Um, but we are biologically emotional beings as women. And men are more primarily hunters. We're, you know, birthers. And so um, when we look at the four seasons, we go back to earth again so we look at the divine mother the the divine mother earth who birthed all creation you know all of the universe and she is just this beautiful goddess this passion mama mama earth and she has the four seasons the winter the spring the summer the autumn so we're lucky that we get to kind of feel those seasons where we live um and those Those outer seasons are a reflection of our inner seasons and our menstrual cycle. So the first day of your bleed is going to be the first, is going to be day one, and that's going to be your winter, your first day of your winter. So in the winter, you look at the season, you get cozy, you want to withdraw, you want to go inwards, you kind of don't really want to do much, you don't really want to be around too many people, you're on your bleed, You just want to get a nice hot drink. And it's the same as when the winter comes. We come in with the the days get darker. We go in. And so it's matching up to the season and to our inner season. So giving ourselves permission to be in the winter season of ourselves. Um, And I go off like a 28-day cycle, but everybody's cycle is going to be different. Some people's are shorter, some people's are longer. Um, but you can begin to track it and then see where your cycle's happening. But if I go off of like a 28 di- day cycle, which is like an average cycle, I go off like seven days. So it'd be day one to seven is your winter week. Then around day mm, five and six, you're going to start to feel a hormonal change as you cross over into the next season, which is spring. Your spring phase is where you've exactly like spring. 
we've come out of the winter and you're, you're like, oh my gosh, the flowers are coming up, the skies are getting brighter, the weather's a little bit warmer and the days are just getting a little bit longer. And it's the same as your inner biology, what is happening within you. So you start to get this new life inside you. Well, the winter week is where women die through the bleed, through the release of the lining of the uterus shredding through, you know, your body. It's releasing everything we've held from the previous month. So we die in the winter phase. So of course, like Mother Earth dies, she starts to bloom again in the spring, which is exactly what we do. And so as we're blooming in this spring phase, which is going to be, say, like from day seven up to seven more days, you're going to start to feel new energy come up Um, and your hormones change again because you're then going to be preparing for ovulation. So around the end of your spring week is where you're going to start to first ovulate. So your hormones change again. And you can get quite a lot of anxiety in this week because if you're not preparing for a baby, your body thinks you are. So your worries about money or your house or environment, even your partner, you're going to ask, is everything good enough to bring this baby into the world? Even if you're not having one, your body is preparing for it. Um, Then we cross over into the summer phase. And again, you'll have those crossover days. And this is where your full ovulation, the full moon is also, if you're not bleeding or if you're menopausal or on the pill, you look at the moon and this is where the full moon is in your ovulation. So it's more of a masculine energy. You're very much more alive. Things are not bothering you as much. You can get things done. You've got more energy. You're at peak. Mm. Um And so also in this phase, we can ask to be uh, asking ourselves when we're not stepping up into the fullest version of who we are. Um, So sometimes in this phase, we can feel like we're too much. Um, Then we move into autumn phase, which a lot of people know, the premenstrual phase. This is going to bring up um, just like autumn where the leaves are falling, this is going to bring up things where you need to release and let go. And this usually comes from past trauma or past relationships. So autumn tends to bring up the past. Um, and spring week, uh, ovulation tends to bring up anxieties of the future. Um, so in this week is where you're going to feel the shedding begin like things are going to highlight for you to look at so you can then release them in the next week which is going to be your bleed again Mm. so you can see the cycle playing out where women get a full detox we have like a full map of what we can follow to an extent obviously is going to change the menstrual cycle changes all the time Um, But it's a good map to continue to follow to just get to know yourself a little bit better. And what I like to do is I started developing something called the divine cycle, which was my guides had guided me to channel healing meditations for each phase of the cycle and journal questions that we can ask to really help us embody each archetype. So a feminine archetype is like our personalities and we have four in the month that go through the four phases of the cycle, the four seasons. So the archetypes um, that I channeled through and designed the divine cycle is your winter week is called the womb woman. Mm-hmm. So you're in the womb and you're in the cave and it's, it's cozy and dark. Spring week is your delicate divine. So everything is, coming really delicately up and spring feels a bit more delicate and the babies are being born, the baby lambs and the chickens and they're very vulnerable and delicate. So are you. Mm -hmm. So that is the archetype. That is the personality you have. And then on the third week, you've got lady in red. So she's your ovulation. She's like the one who puts the red lipstick on and the red dress, (laughs) (laughs) the unstoppable version of you 
that that version, that personality of you, that sassy and fiery and sexy. So that's your lady in red. And then you've got divine diva, which is, you know, it says it for itself. Yeah. The, the the autumn phase where you might be a diva, demanding, bossy, snappy, angry, rageful, whatever it is you go through. So when I designed that, it just allowed people to understand their personalities as well and the four feminine archetypes that you have within your divine cycle. Mm. So does that explain that? Oh, my God. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> The, while you were saying this, I, I was watching a video by Teal Swan. I don't know if you heard of Teal Swan. So she yeah. was she was talking about periods. I was like, okay, let me just click on that and watch this. And she was talking about thousands of years ago where, where women actually used to gather around and they yeah. used to get a, that period around the same time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And they, you, they used to bleed into the earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's called a red tent. So um, the red tents first originated in caves. So women would gather in the front of the cave to bleed. So the cave would be like, if you think of the cave as like the yoni, the sacred space, because the word yoni, vagina, yoni, is Sanskrit for sacred space. That's actually what it means. So the caves would be the cave going into the womb, like the female cave. So when you were bleeding, you would gather together there because you would share your wisdom. When we bleed, um, part of our brain becomes more open to spiritual guidance. So you become more intuitive, more psychic. um, And it's a time where you want to release your tears you know, usually on the actual release of the bleed, that's when people tend to kind of cry through not knowing why they're crying. You know, they might just cry at like, saw this thing on the TV and I just cried and I don't know why. It's usually on the bleed. Whereas the tears that come premenstrual are usually tears of anger and frustration mm. and tears that come after the bleed around ovulation are usually tears of like anxiety. But the tears of the bleed are just these pure emotional tears that they're just with the bleed. And so with that comes a lot of wisdom. It comes a lot of compassion. And so women would gather together to hold each other in these times, to share their burdens, to not judge each other, to share wisdom that was coming through for not only the them, but it might have been for the land, it might have been for the community. There was a lot of psychic Christ light that came through on the bleed. So when this developed, it kind of might have gone into mud huts. And then as time went on, it might have been temples or certain places in the villages. But they would be so special and so sacred if anyone was ever coming into the um, you know, village to destroy the village, the first thing that they would burn down was the red tents oh, because they knew how powerful these sacred spaces were. And another amazing thing about the red tent, which I love men to listen to to this, is that our noble men, they really really um, validated our emotions and our cycle. So when it came to um, the women gathering in the red tents, men would bring us food. They would they would take it in terms to protect the tents. We would have men outside, maybe on a horse, or, you know, we would have our protectors. Our noble men were the the men that were were holding the space for us just like the feminine and masculine energy right that masculine energy would hold that space for us they would protect us they would bring us food they would make sure we were okay that we were warm whatever we needed they would bring for us in that time of our cycle because they knew how sacred and important it was for us to honor it and for them to also be honoring it Mm. so you know when I teach clients on their bleed 
I always say to them in this phase, like, I mean, if you do have a partner, amazing, but this is a really great time to start asking what you need and for to give him a chance to step up and be that noble man that he probably really wants to be, but sometimes men just don't know how. And so this part of the bleed is such a great dynamic in relationships because it, they're the simple things of like, just protect me whilst I'm in my bleed phase. And you know, men, they do love to be protective. And so the menstrual cycle can really start to help your relationships as well, because it gives you an opportunity to learn so much more about yourself. You're able to communicate it to the people around you. Mm. Um, But yeah, that's what the red tents were. Yeah, they're amazing. amazing. Um, And I, I hold a free one online called the Rose Red Tent every six to eight weeks where women get together and we just talk about this stuff like yeah and people you know I offer women to share their intuitive wisdom and we just sit in circle and just kind of see what comes up and yeah oh that's really beautiful because I'm also thinking about a culture aspect as well like I've been brought up in a culture where you don't talk about period it's like it's something you should be ashamed of so it's you know when you go to pray you shouldn't be on your period so that's like because my back my culture my cultural background is muslim even though i'm not muslim myself but that's the way they they it's very masculine based mm. it's like well you shouldn't you should wear white you shouldn't bleed you shouldn't um it's like and we don't talk about it whatsoever because it's a, it's disgusting it's a sin right and that's where that's how I've been brought up to be and there is so much shame I had to work through that there was so much shame around my belief system and the shame around talking about period talking about um sexual energy because that's another thing it's a sinful you should do it with your like behind closed doors everything like you know but you shouldn't talk about it Mm. openly so I like like a couple of years ago got into I um my my friends Mickey Owen and Emma so they teach like a conscious relationship um course and I'm me this is me being vulnerable and open where I'm 35 year old woman right so I was I've not been in any relationship for that you know we for for se- se- several reasons and when he was talking about the sexual development and I was like, okay, well, this is going to be fun. He's like, first stage, shame. That's where it hit me <laughs> first. And then I, I realized, oh my God, I'm in shame. I'm in shame. And then I was like thinking about the culture aspect, the limiting beliefs that I've been brought up around, right? And I'm just working through that, just really embracing feminine because I was masculine majority of my life. You know, I've been not on the go 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 because I used to um I was living in my own hell so you know many people know my story where I I was suffering from crippling anxiety to a point I could not leave the house so that was my life for 10 years in that point I was masculine enough I used to game I used to suppress my emotions and anything feminine was not in my picture at all until I had my spiritual awakening and that's when everything like started clearing it was like embracing more of my feminine energy than the mask I was completely tomboyish you know years ago um yeah so it's really kind of hit home like I didn't know about this circle uh the sorry cycles of females like you it's just like it it makes perfect sense that we we should be shredding we should be detoxing every month and we should be moving through that not not let our environment dictate the the interfere with that 100 percent. thank you for sharing that as well thank you so much because sharing it is part of the healing process as well isn't it and just being vulnerable and knowing that there are going to be so many women that literally resonate with everything that you've said and that's where you've stepped up and listened to your calling because you are a a, 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 um, 
a leader and a light for those other women, especially in your culture, if if that is, you know, how it's been for you. And there's going to be so many women that feel the same. So to just hear somebody being able to be strong enough to just look at it in a different way and be like, actually, I was carrying shame around that mm-hmm. is, is so important for us. And I think shame, the shame healing, there is when you start menstrual cycle, like, healing and womb healing because menstrual cycle sinking is great but that's very logical and structured there is so much more to the menstrual cycle healing and empowerment Mm -hmm. and I think when you really begin to journey into that and through that like you said through the bleed rather than against the current of the natural rhythm of the feminine but actually allowing yourself to flow with the blood you know allowing it to flow out of you uh, uh, just giving yourself permission to um instead of trying to stop it it's kind of like your shame does come up because of course this is where we hold the shame because this is where it's been suppressed for like two three thousand years and as you said before in your culture which I know to be true, like through the teachings of Mary Magdalene and the Roman Empire and things like that, the the female reproductive system is so powerful. Mm. It it kind of goes against the order of some of the masculine principles of society. So it starts to make you see from new eyes of, oh, wow, I can actually really hold more compassion for women also men who are born into this world it's not their fault either because they've known no difference but to avoid the period and to think it's disgusting you know we've done it they don't even have one so they're going off what they've been taught and told whereas a lot of the time we are blaming men but actually it's nobody's fault. It's just the society around us, the environments we've been taught to be in. Mm-hmm. And so the more that I think women start stepping down into their womb, into their bleed, into their feminine energy, the more we're, it's going to help men step up. Mm-hmm. And it's going to create a better balance between that feminine and masculine, not just on an energetic level, but on a physical level global level as well you know and it might be a big responsibility for a woman because everything comes from us that's a massive responsibility for us and some people might say that sucks why don't men have periods why don't they have to give birth but see is the most beautiful gift you've ever been given if you can start taking responsibility for that men will start to honor it. But until we start to honor and take responsibility for it, they're not gonna. Mm, 100%. They're not gonna. So it is our responsibility to to step down into those, you know, lower regions rather than being up here in the masculine all the time. It's coming down and, and being with these really feminine raw parts of ourselves and and learning to heal and evolve through them so we can teach the next generations we can teach our partners they can then teach other people and the ripple effect is amazing through that you know but it's not a man's job to do that for us no we gotta do it ourselves yeah 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 so what are your thoughts on PCOS so I've had that as well um Mm -hmm. it's quite interesting because I've used to have my period like six months, three months, four months. Yeah. It was all over the place until I, again, had my spiritual awakening. Now it's every month. You're like you're working through the trauma, getting it out of my system and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's- yeah. so um, it's one of the, obviously anyone who's going through anything like that always seek medical advice as well, you know, like absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's one of the symptoms of, the the womb stress and trauma you know like the womb is the first place to react to stress um we are our central nervous system the vagus nerve starts at our cervix wraps around the vital organs of our body and to the throat and so when it comes to stress and things like that and trauma that creates stress the first place to impact 
it has impact on is the womb, the uterus, the womb being everything, the uterus, the fallopian tubes, um, the vaginal canal, the lining of the uterus and the vaginal canal. The cervix is a really, really important space as well because it holds a lot there. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's one of the symptoms of, of, of just this buildup of emotion, stagnant emotion, stress, um, perhaps things we've just not dealt with because it has to go somewhere and the womb is a hollow space. So it has to live somewhere, you know, like, for example, if you were a stress molecule and you wanted to survive, you're not going to go into a place in the body that's, you're going to go to a place that's going to be able to help you breed, mm. <laughs> push it so far down we push it so far down into the womb space because it's so avoided and so ignored. It's just the perfect breeding place for stress. So we hold a lot of stress there and that can build up and build up over time. And that is where we get things like this, this the, the womb symptoms. Uh, endometriosis is really beginning to show itself now um, in different ways as well you know, having cysts, irregular bleeds, painful bleeds, painful sex, um, you know, um, infections like BV, thrush, cystitis, things like that are all are all pretty much symptoms of some kind of stress that we're holding in the body. And there are many techniques you can do to just, even just at home to do to start to release and Wound massage, uh, essential oils, um, breathing techniques, meditation is great, but also embodiment practice, moving the hips, um, dancing, moving the hips, you know, trying to really release the tension from around the hips and things like that are really simple things. Um, mantra is really good because anything that is going on within the neck and the throat is usually going down in the going on in the pelvis region the womb the yoni so if you've got sore throat sore glands the there's a fine chance something's going on down here it might be a lower back ache mm. um so yeah they're all they're all kind of signs that the womb wants your attention and love and there is something that wants to be released. Yeah, that makes so much sense when you said like it's holding that stress. And I was under a lot of stress throughout because I was I care for my mom. So that's a lot of stress itself. And then suppressing my emotions because I had to be the adult. I had to, yeah, so tap into masculine, go, 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 helping mom do this, open this can, open this, open, do this. So yeah, yeah it makes sense why my room kind of just went out of whack because like yo you're what are you doing <laughs> right. yeah and things like when we're under stress what are the things that people do like they might go out drinking or eat the pizza and their diet goes out of rhythm and then that actually then impacts your hormones which then impacts your fertility your menstrual cycle mm. so it's not only just the cause of the stress it's what you're doing with the stress it's how you're reacting to the stress it's how you're managing the stress and we're brought up in this society that says avoid it go out drinking maybe go have a cigarette or a vape Maybe you want to just go and indulge in that big tub of ice cream. Mm. And there are so many people that I see online that say, have your tub of ice cream on your period. You deserve it. I'm going to be transparent with people. Do not have that tub of ice cream. Don't mm. have it on your period. No, no. Do not have it because it's going to affect your your hormones and your period. I love ice cream, but have it in your summer week. Have it in your ovulation week, in the week where you're not stressed you know indulge in those things in the different phases of your cycle but when you are bleeding your body is detoxing it it needs to be purified mm -hmm. to release all that stress for you that you've been holding um so what and, so sorry go on. Uh, yeah so, that's yeah, it yeah yeah so what sort of um food would you recommend when you're on your bleed what sort of things um just really kind of just as just as kind of balanced as possible really it's not about deducting 
you know, the carbs or anything like that. It's just having that balanced diet, you know, with every single meal, you want to be looking at a carb, a protein and a healthy fat. And as long as you've got all three, that's a pretty healthy balance to have. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't want to keep cutting your carbs out, because it's going to give you a hormone imbalance, Mm -hmm. it's that might affect your emotions and your stress levels. So you just want a really nice, easy, balanced kind of uh, kind of diet. I mean, I'm not a nutritionist. So um there isn't there is not so much I can say on that level of things however um currently in my divine cycle I have been introduced to a nutritionist (laughs) and um I'm working with them to try and get something in order to 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 give like a nice uh food plan for people Oh, but, you know, just keeping it balanced, hydration, three, you know, your three meals a day, your breakfast, your lunch, your dinner, a fat, a carb, you know, and a protein. And you, you know, you'll be good, but it's, you'll know when you get them cravings. You'll know there's when like, you get them. Just like, I just had a thought, like uh, with, with meat, because you're taking, are you taking on uh, energy of another animal? on hormones kind of thing do you think um this is like a really I guess this is like a really vast thing and it all it guess it depends on your personal preference of food doesn't it um there is theories that we take on emotions from animals but then if we look at trees plants Mm. fruits they're all living energy beings so you know, like if you're not going to look after a plant, it's going to die, you know. Um, and if that plant has got the apples on it, you know, that you eat, I think everything has energy. And I think it's just the way you look at it. And again, it's just being in balance and looking at what meat you're eating. So I I eat meat, um, mainly kind of chicken. Um, but if I eat chicken, it's um, corn fed and free range. And I will pay the extra six pounds for that because I know that the chicken is being looked after. And ultimately, if it's serving my house and I'm serving people, I need to be, you know, optimal health. Not only with the chicken uh, will I make sure it's I buy it like that. I I pray and I thank it. And um, I have the free food prayer online if people want to download it. Um, and I bring some energy into my food. And also I kind of take the indigenous way of eating meat as I studied like, you know, the Native Americans, the indigenous and how they eat meat. And it's like, a, it's like a ceremonial ritual to eat meat. It's, it's something that should be really honored. So getting into the habit of just prayer and gratitude before you're eating the meat or while you're cutting the meat, be present mm-hmm. with it. You know, there's a really big difference between just pushing it in the oven and not thinking about it. Being present with that animal that is that is here to serve you, which is serving your children, your community, the people around you. Um, and I always buy a full chicken as well. So every part of the animal is being used. Mm. Um, so whatever's left over is I give to my cat. Um and I know, like, I feel like I've really honored that animal. And I think it's all about your, yeah, the way that you look at me and eat it. But perhaps there could be different kinds of elements to to, to overeating meat, perhaps, or too much protein that might um, give you a bit of, of hormone imbalance. But I'm not entirely, like glued up on all that stuff yeah yeah I, I I used to eat meat so much like and yeah. um but then I used to be overweight like you said like eating that pizza or eating the ice cream all the time because I was like trying to numb everything and then I completely went vegan for seven years I've just got back on meat again yes. so it's like intuitive eating it's like yes. my body needed that seven years of no meat mm. and then I was like you bring it back in now um there's not caught up in just listen to what your body is saying your body's absolutely and don't shame yourself if you eat meat like you know being a spiritual the the most spiritual thing you can do is be human Hmm. 
You yeah. know, it's not about and going so far out of your body to an enlightenment part that you're not on earth anymore. Yeah. And that most certainly doesn't make you a better person. Yeah. You know, the most spiritual thing you can do is be human. Yeah. And it's just being mindful, isn't it? It's just really just taking those moments to to be grateful for this food in front of us or, you know, for this, whatever it is you're eating. Yeah. yeah I often give Reiki to to yeah. my uh, to my food. So it's that's so it's, great. So do great. I. I'm like sat in the restaurant and like <laughs> people looking at, at you, what are you doing? <laughs> this is magic. <laughs> so true. I oh, love it. So you'll be talking about perspective from men and women, right? Yeah. So what if like two females get in a relationship? We mm-hmm. know how it worked with male and females. How do they help yeah. each other during the cycle this is a really interesting question because I have a I have a couple of clients who are in same-sex relationships so I've actually asked this question I was like can I ask you some questions because I would love to know again when I was studying like Native American culture they they have something called two spirit and that means like you embody both like you know if you look at like Native American men they've got like jewelry in their faces they wear like long skirts and they wear their hair in plaits and you know they have you know all these markings on their face and they're really not afraid to be feminine in in their own ways even though they're like really masculine looking and their their concept is called two spirit so they believe we're all born with kind of like Obviously, we've got the anatomy of the gender, but they believe we're just all born as one. So actually, in their culture, they don't see it as any less than if you're in like a same sex kind of, uh, I don't know, um, relationship or something's going on. But they do stick to reproduction. They stick to, you know, reproducing. Um so for one, I think like it's really coming back to the energetics, really. And again, social structure that has created this imbalance. But when I was speaking to my client, I asked her, like, how does it work? And she says, there's always one of us who is more masculine or feminine mm. energetically. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean all the time, because I think even in any relationship, I mean, I'm a leader, I own a business, of course, that I've got a strong masculine energy when I need to have it. It's also learning that I don't have to be in that all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with the feminine. If you're always in your feminine, you're still out of balance. You've got to step into your masculine at times. It's not about always being in your feminine energy. At the moment, we're going through a radical change on earth where we're coming back into relationship with the feminine because it's been gone for so long. But it doesn't mean to neglect and disrespect your inner masculine and be like, I don't ever need to be in my masculine again. Well, if you did that, you wouldn't get anything done and you're probably going to get hurt. Mm. Well, you're creating a healthy masculine inside of you. You've got to have both. So yeah, she did say I'm more feminine in my relationship. And usually I tend to choose um, women who are more like the doers and the action takers and the leaders. And yeah. Yeah. Oh, so it does work. It's yeah. So that's kind of what she she said. So it was really interesting. But I would like to learn more about that because I think it's very important. But I think if you actually just strip it down to the energetics, it doesn't really matter what body you're in because you've still got the energy, the two spirit, Mm. you know, it's going to play out. It's going to play out with your pets. It's going to play out with your colleagues. It's going to play out with your parents, your children, you know, plays out in every relationship we have. Yeah, I think it's like in a healthy relationship as well that works, like balances it out. Otherwise, if if it's unhealthy masculine, unhealthy feminine then it's like trauma bond right there (laughs) right I know exactly and like personally I would always be more of the person that wanted control and I found it very difficult to be 
in my feminine without being in control, like an over-controlling feminine. Mm. So it wasn't so much I was in my masculine more. I was actually in my wounded feminine of control. Mm. And I wasn't in a a healthy feminine. Um, But a lot of the men that I will tend to choose are more on that masculine side because protection it depends on your morals and values but like that protection and that leadership and that security and safety is so important for me personally so I think we do also choose uh partners based on you know that kind of thing but it doesn't ever mean I can't be the strong one for us if he's having an emotional meltdown like men have meltdowns too like they have emotions too doesn't mean they're not masculine you know it's it's just really seeing it all from the perspective of who we are and 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 who they are being one really but personally I do like a man who's more in that masculine energy who can give me guidance and lead me into a better version of myself Mm -hmm. um and then likewise really respect my intuition because it's a massive part of who I am yeah so yeah it's it's having that balance I am seeing a lot of masculines going through their healing journey as well like there's a lot of men circles nowadays it's like they are able to express that express their emotions whereas for years they haven't you know so which is we're moving forward in the right direction we and are and I think it's because we're expressing ours because when we express ours and we level up as women um they have to meet us and the only way to meet us at the where we're at is for them to go through the same thing mm-hmm. um so if we're not meeting ourselves at those depths we're certainly not going to meet a man who is going to meet himself at those depths Mm -hmm. and we want that alignment don't we we want someone to at least be aware of um the way that things kind of play out and you know not saying that anyone's perfect because we're never going to be perfect but just that nice open-mindedness is 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 a good alignment to have (laughs) yeah beautifully put I've actually got one more question I've actually also got rapid fire questions for you Okay. Um, but what are your thoughts on birth control? Now that's a mm. topic where it's it's fifty fifty in the world right now, isn't it? <laughs> I think if you were to look at what if you go and do your own research on birth control, anyone listening, um, be prepared to read things that are going to trigger you, that are gonna make you feel perhaps like you want to be off of it and also it's it it, for me it and looking at other women it brings a lot of shame up because birth control disconnects you completely from ovulating Mm. the one thing as a woman that you're gifted with the one this one beautiful gift that we're given this gold And when you're on the pill for so long, I see it. So many women don't want to face it because they know that they made that choice to take it. So firstly, please, if you're looking into it, don't shame yourself. You were taught to go on it from when you were 15 years old. It's not your fault. Um, But really do the research because, you know, it's for me, I think there's so many better methods of, you know, um, contraception. And not only that, the pill really does disconnect you from your feminine energy, from your emotions. It might be putting a plaster on your trauma right now and your emotions right now, but long time effects of taking something like the pill is going to have more impact on your health and your mental health than actually being like, I'm I'm going to go through these next six months and and wean myself off of this this tablet. Mm. Go for medical advice, but also maybe look at holistic advice or someone like me who does the cycle work and the womb work to be able to guide you through it. Because the first three months of coming off the pill is going to be challenging because you're going to be faced with emotions you might not have 
felt for 10 years or five years or however long you've been on it. But yeah, do your research um, and know that there is many, many, many ways that you can trust yourself to be on your own contraceptive timeline. It's all about trusting yourself, having having that trust in yourself to say, actually, I've got to be careful today. I'm ovulating, you know? So taking responsibility that, okay, if I do have sex and ovulation, I might get pregnant. Mm. And then I deal with that. But I think taking the pill can take away our responsibility as women. And I think a lot of the time that can also crush our trust, our inner trust, because our inner trust is what's going to help us trust other people and other things around us. And when it comes to life and giving birth to life and creating life, that requires an element of trust in yourself. Um, So coming off the pill is a massive, a massive um, healing of self-worth, inner self-love and trust yeah beautifully said really beautifully said I think it's like also many people are probably on like you know being diagnosed with PCOS and they go into I I was on it like for a year I was given the pill to regulate my periods and I took it and when I came off it was worse than ever emotionally physically my periods were so painful um but actually like there is hope there is so much hope because now that I'm sitting here, I'm telling you guys, like I get period every month and yeah. most of them are pain free and I lost a lot of weight. I, it's like it feels great because I've done quite a lot of inner work, trauma work, um, a lot of things that you can do outside of just the pill, a lot of holistic work. So much. It's just the easy. It's just been the easy societal way take the tablet, get on with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. but, and suppress the female, even more, the female emotions even more and the female power even more. It's, yeah. it's always been an easy way to suppress us. Why did they never give it to men? Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's always something else behind it to, to kind of get us to be more like men, you know, to get us on that rat race and, yeah. We're just, like I said before, we're just not designed like men. We're just not. We need to give ourselves more credit for being women mm. and really honor like what it is to, to have a womb and a cycle and these amazing emotions, mm. you know. Yeah, and I feel it's just the, a system itself as well. It's like not getting to the root of the problem. It's always on the surface, a quick mm. solution, quick fixes, which is temporary but does a lot more damage in the long run. Mm yeah exactly um, all right are you ready for this rapid fire questions yeah <laughs> let's do it <laughs> okay so what is your definition of universe god life my definition of god is um the gosh what a great question i guess my definition of god is the light that exists within you with well within all of us that we access through the spiritual eye of the heart so not through the mind not through anything outside of us but through the vision of of what we create through the spiritual eye of the heart i would say that is our god light we're all children of god and God not being something that is outside of us, but God being something that we allow to see ourselves in, you know? Mm, beautifully. Wow. That makes sense. Oh, amazing. <laughs> amazing. Um, what do you think happens when you die? I think that we um I think that we get shown like our lives. Of like, I think maybe like we get shown the debrief of our life. We get to look <laughs> at it like a little film or something. Maybe <laughs> sit with some popcorn. Um, and I think that we, it depends. I think we might have to go for healing. It depends how we have passed over. Um, if we passed over from like trauma, 
uh, or pain, we might have to go to temples of healing, like soul healing temples. I know if I know like with suicide, they go to a healing temple for their souls mm -hmm. until they're ready to move on to the next kind of assignment. Um, but I believe we just kind of either come back here and have to go over our lessons we haven't learned as a school. Um, and that might be years and years and years to come. I do think we get a choice. Um, and I also think there are other types of um, like planets or places we get to go to to experience a different kind of mm. soulful experience. But I think we all probably knew each other before we got here and had this all planned out and 100%. yeah 100%. so I, I don't believe we we end I think that we just continue as, as a soul yeah 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 it's like it's like a playground it's like you go into that playground what's the contract <laughs> yeah. mm. I don't know if I can be bothered to go to earth school again like, I might just give it another seven years <laughs> and you're just like access denied <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly uh, okay so how do you define religion and spirituality um I this is so funny because on my new website one of the one of the quotes that I use is um spirituality does not come from religion it comes from the soul mm. oh yeah yeah I felt that really good really good yeah. Um, what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn? Oh, um, wow. I don't know if any of my lessons have been fully learned yet. <laughs> it's the long um, if I'm being completely honest, like it, the layers, I, I don't think the layers ever really stop coming up until we're really ready to leave the earth. I think, I think, I think the one of the most challenging ones that I have are um self-worth, I think is a big one. Um, knowing that I'm worthy of love, being loved in all of who I am and even in the parts of me that I think are really ugly to be to be loved. Um, and I think that comes with li a lifetime of different relationships and experiences. I think one, I think one of the lessons I think I'm, I'm, I've done really well at, which I may have ticked off a little bit, <laughs> is communication. Like learning how to communicate well, mm -hmm. um, and that has come with literally having to like learn a new language mm -hmm. um, and setting boundaries. I think that is another really great lesson. And I was I was learning them. And the one thing that helped me cement them was the divine cycle. It was my menstrual cycle and womb healing. Mm, Took me to the other level of that that game. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> you have passed. Next level. <laughs> I love it. Um, do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best futures? Oh, I think that people with the, I think we chose to come here to experience things as a child um, because it's, it's, it's very different to having the freedom of choice as an adult. And I, I think this is really complex. I think everybody deserves, regardless of their childhood, or hard begin. I think everyone deserves the same amount of love and respect and honor and and worthiness in this life. But I do believe that perhaps some of us who have experienced things in our childhood are given opportunities to 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 like lead and to to heal in that area to be able to teach others. Um, you know, because I I teach the way that I teach. I can teach all the great stuff from the mistakes I made, but from my childhood that was taken out of my hands, it's kind of like there there's where my most deep spiritual kind of teachings come from. Mm. 
So, and I think it depends what you're willing to sacrifice and if you're willing to really like step two feet in, um, you know, so yeah, I think everybody deserves the same equal amount of love. I've got beautiful friends who are so powerful and so such powerful leaders in their work and, you know, their childhoods have had their ups and downs, but, you know, I just think, yeah, I just think it can be just as difficult for them because sometimes they don't have something to pinpoint their trauma on. Um, and I think that could be quite challenging for people. Whereas I kind of know mm. with my childhood, like a lot of where it's come from. Um, so I think I'm I'm actually kind of gifted and lucky in that in that sense. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Um I'm fully in present moment when. Ah, <sighs> I'm fully in the present moment when I think when I'm out in nature. Oh yeah. That's ah uh, yeah. Best answer ever. <laughs> it's, best. it's just even when I'm not in nature, but I'm meditating with nature. Yeah. That's presence. Like when I remember just the fact that the leaves don't really do much, but they just receive the light from the sun and then that tree produces oxygen for me to breathe. Yeah. It's like look at the work that's, that's going on there. <laughs> that's presence, yeah. you know. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Um, do you believe that there is an end to healing? No, I don't believe that there's an end to it. No. I think that I think healing isn't an object or a thing. I think it's like it's just a being. It's just yeah. part of the way that we just be in life. It's it's part of the journey, but I think we can get trapped in that, that there's an end. The, there is no destination. The, um, the arrival point is just right now. Mm, mm. It's yeah. be okay. It's like be okay, detached in a way where, well, it's going to be like this, like this, just yeah. acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's awareness and acceptance and, um, you know, I know for me right now, what I've really been moving through is, you know, with everything that happened in my childhood, sure, I'm going to have to keep healing those layers as and when they come up. Mm. But it doesn't mean that my child is ever going to go away. And mm. it doesn't have to. And it doesn't have to go away. And I don't have to disown it. But I just don't um allow it to control me I just am aware that it's part of who I am and that's what I come with mm -hmm. you know I'm not going to pretend like I don't come with it just to pretend like I'm healed from it mm -hmm. um because I'm never going to know what the life's going to throw at me to trigger me and that's part of what life is about and it's part of dropping control yeah beautifully put yeah. uh the world needs more of what Oh, the world needs more communication. Yes. Um, so if there is someone who's going through adversity and dark night of the soul, spiritual awakening, and they're finding it hard to navigate through it, and they're not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. what would you say to them? Um, I would say... I think let's go back to nature. I would say get into nature. And this is what I did. So I'm going to go off like a personal experience of when I was in that. Find yourself a place in nature that feels home for you. It could be a tree. It could be just a place. It could be a forest that's like an hour drive away. It could be somewhere that's local. It doesn't matter. I would I would firstly find a place in nature where you can go to for stillness, for peace. Um, nature is an amazing healer. When your feet are on the floor, the electromagnetic frequency from the earth, it just is it's healing if you're like 20 minutes on the earth. And just 
allow yourself to be in the nature and nature will show you the light of, of some sort. It absolutely will. And whether it's just a moment of bliss that you get in a second when you're sat there, that will be the light that you need to know it exists. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh, beautifully put. Beautiful put. How can people contact you? <laughs> um, so you can contact me through my Instagram, my social media. Um, I am um, also putting a new website up. So it's going to be on Friday the 13th. It, it, it um, launches. So that's just graceprosser.com. Um, and yeah, you can see my offerings there. You can have to me on Instagram. Um, yeah, come along if you want to come to some of my my free online sessions, which I do. I do forest bathing retreats. Um, I do um, obviously womb healing and menstrual cycle empowerment. Um, I have a retreat coming up in Glastonbury in December, more about the divine feminine and things like that. So lots going on, lots of like online spiritual and also um, womb courses you can kind of dive into on your own, in your own time. Amazing. So yeah, there's, there's lots to lots of ways you can kind of connect and yeah, and kind of feel into my work. Oh, amazing. Oh, thank you, Grace. It's just been an absolute pleasure interviewing you. So much insight, so many nuggets to mm. take away from this episode. And I'm sure so many of our listeners will take it away. And yeah. I have personally, I've just probably had my whole life and it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> connecting the dots, right? Yeah, it happens, doesn't yeah. it? It happens. Yeah. So thank, yeah. You. thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I'm glad we connected. Yeah. We're going to be friends now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good. Thank you for listening to this episode. I would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. You can share your thoughts on my Facebook or Instagram, Madhya Sosen. If you would like to listen to this episode, I am on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Just search soul awakenings with madhya sosan if you enjoyed this episode then please do rate and share this with your family and friends as that will help me out a lot thank you so much once again and i will see you in the next episode